car crashes, defective products, dangerous drugs, injuries, and abuse. Across the state of Alabama, the attorneys, proudly sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright, are here to serve you. Your tough legal questions answered by our experts with host David Lamb and the attorneys of Hollis Wright. Hello and welcome in to the attorneys. Thank you for joining us tonight. Got an interesting topic of conversation, have a panel of experts, and we have you, everything we need for a great show. We really appreciate you joining us tonight and each and every week right here on the attorneys. Before we get to our guest and the introductions, a reminder of how you can join our conversation, <coughs> call, text, email, that information at the bottom of your screen. Also Hollis Wright makes available each and every Sunday evening during the show, uh, attorneys from the firm standing by live to speak with you. That's a free off air and confidential converse, uh, uh, conversation that is yours for the taking. All you have to do is get in touch with them. So uh, leading our conversation is the managing partner of Hollis Wright. Josh Wright, good to see you, sir. You look good. Thank you. You too. Thank you very much. You doing well? I'm doing well. You? We're doing fabulous. Good, good, um, good. You know, we're going to be doing a, a great show today on what to do after a work-related injury. We are so lucky uh, to have Alwyn Horn with our firm uh, on today. And this is not primarily what he does, but is a big focus of his practice group at our law firm. And in addition to that, he's got uh, other lawyers that work with him on these cases. Mm -hmm. And so we're so very lucky to have you. Alwyn, super happy to have you on to talk about work-related injuries. Well, Josh and David, thanks so much for having me again. I always enjoy it. Well, and you have probably been over close to 500 shows now. Um, on more than anybody else because well, that should say a lot not just about you and your prowess as a uh, workers comp lawyer but you're one of the state's best in this area well, and well, I, I know you. you probably get that don't uh, get struck by lightning that, that's it that's it <laughs> but you know a lot of the reason why we do different spins on this show is because work-related injuries are something that hit the law all the time and so we're just happy to have you on to talk through some of this stuff. Um, I, I know that we'll get plenty of questions today, but one of the things to just kind of go from a, a jumping off point, and I'm not sure I've ever asked you this before, how did you get into workers' comp compared to some of the other practice groups? And I know you do other things too, but sure. how did you get into comp initially? Josh, the, the first firm I worked with, shoot, 25 years ago, that was their primary focus. And while they, they handled a lot of different areas and aspects of the law, that's what I started doing a lot of and you really have to be involved or what when you work in a workers compensation claim you're heavily involved with the client and I like dealing with people I like dealing with clients I like the, the relationships that can be established and I think I just found a niche with it and I'm comfortable with it and um, that, that, I think that's what I like about it, the relationship aspect of it. Yeah. Can I ask um, so um, it's always interesting that question is always interesting to me how folks get into yeah. this it was kind of the family business, though, in your household, wasn't it? Like now, your dad was a well. My a dad was a judge, but right. but my dad actually defended cases. Right. And and we're here. We represent the client. My dad actually re represented the insurance companies. But the good thing about that, my dad was with our firm for a while. You know, in his your honor capacity. But um, it, we got a lot of insight from him as to what the other side. But would growing do. up in that household, I mean, did you ever consider anything else, or did you just kind of think I'm I'm going to be a lawyer? I, I've 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 always thought that maybe the way I go. We'll yeah. put it that way. He, he, he was a, a rebel. He went the opposite direction of his dad. His dad goes to the defense side, all one comes to the plaintiff's that side. That happens a lot. So, um, all right, so one of the issues that comes up a lot is, and we'll get calls about this, how, how do you define what arises in kind of a, a work environment versus not a work environment? Um, because there are a lot of circumstances where, you know, someone may be driving home from work, um, and they may be outside the line and scope of their authority as an employee at that time. But that issue comes up. So what, what's the buzz language and how do you determine if this is a work related? And Josh, you, you, you led on to the buzz language. It's if you are performing a, a duty or an obligation or part of your job task during the line scope and course of your employment for your employer. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, if you're doing some type of job task to fulfill the end of your job duties or, or doing something on behalf of your employer, if your employer is going to benefit from what you're doing, maybe a simple way to say it. Um, there are a lot of people that have you know traumatic events meaning they're they're 
you know, you, we have a lot of construction workers that may be working on a job and, and they're involved in an accident and it's an acute injury. You also have other people that, you know, may work in chemical plants or things like that, um, where over a period of time, just by being at the job, they, they develop certain types of conditions that may affect the brain or the lung or the kidney, kidneys. And, and those also are considered to have occurred in the line scope and course of the treatment. So you can have acute injuries that happened in the line scope and course, even in a car wreck, if you're hit by somebody, you're driving a truck, you know, another truck hits you, or you can have something that develops over time referred to as, you know, an occupational disease or even a cumulus cumulative stress injury. Repetitive nature, a lot of people are involved in activities where they have to use their hands the same method, whether they're, they're packing boxes or, or lifting or manipulating things on an assembly line with their hands and they develop carpal tunnel. A lot of people do a lot of overhead work with their shoulders and it's repetitive and, and it leads to um, cumulative stress injuries as well. But as long as you're fulfilling your employer's objective, it will be covered. What What's the process you use um, when these cases come into the firm, what you, I, I know you and Harris are evaluating cases all the time. Um, what's the process that you use in order to determine whether or not it even falls within the comp statute initially? Well, well is it I, just gathering the facts? It, it, that's exactly what it is. I mean, we have we have an intake form that we've created that we think highlights what's important to determine number one if you have a compensable claim, yeah. which takes you know you want to know wh when the accident happened, how the accident happened, were there witnesses to the accident. One of the big issues is you know employees. A lot of times you have these really loyal long-term employees that might get hurt on the job and they don't want to report it yeah. because they want to they don't want to cause their employer or they think their employer any grief or any problems with having to make an insurance claim and you know if you don't do that immediately which is one of the most important things it can be detrimental to your claim so you know it's good to just off topic it's good to report this immediately if possible you know by law you have five five days to do it but you actually have up to 90 but that's one important factor and then you know we want somebody to make sure to see if they've had medical treatment you yeah. know you want to go get medical treatment when this injury occurs or when you're starting feeling symptoms or pain because the longer you the wait you got to people have to realize they're dealing with an insurance company yeah. they're not dealing with the employer you know they may have a good relationship with the employer but at the end of the day the workers compensation insurance company or fund is going to be the one that is paying for this claim yeah you and you raise a good point how do you handle an employee that says I've been employed here 20 years. I don't want to uh, do anything that's going to be detrimental to the company and potentially detrimental to my job. How do you manage that? Like, how, how, what do you say to them? Because I know there are people sitting on the couch right now that says, mm -hmm. I've had a work-related injury. My wife is telling me I need to report this, or my husband is telling me this, but I'm afraid to do it. How do you uh, deal with that? This, this is what we typically say. We understand your loyalty and allegiance, but ultimately you need to look out for yourself and your family, because what if this injury becomes debilitating? What if you think you have a back strain and you end up having a fusion or a spinal surgery that prevents you from going back to work? And you're not gonna have that employment anymore because you're not physically capable of doing it. Yeah. But the primary way we handle this is that we tell them, understand this, explain to your employer or don't explain to your employer that you have to make this insurance claim because you need medical treatment or you're going to need compensation and uh, it's actually the in insurance company that will be paying for the the claim itself you're not taking money directly from your employer of course people pay insurance premiums just like companies do but ultimately the claim is against the insurance company yeah and by the way they're responsible for paying the insurance premiums because they're responsible if they have more than five employees for having that's right insurance no different than our law firm is responsible for having workers cop insurance. All right, when we come back, I want to go through some of the questions because I know we'll get plenty of questions. We'll go through some of those. All right, we're stepping aside our first break of the evening. As we do so, a reminder how you can join our conversation. Also, the opportunity to speak with uh, attorneys who are standing by live from the firm of Hollis Wright. Uh, your opportunity for the taking. Stay tuned. We're coming right back. I'm Josh Wright with the law firm of Hollis Wright, a personal injury law firm, and thank you for watching The Attorneys. We hope you, a friend, or a loved one never needs legal counsel for a case. But if you do, the goal of the show is simple, to provide answers and legal counsel when you need it the most. Your call to the show is free and off air. So if you have questions specific to the show or related to other accident or injury topics, call, email, or text us. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, or go to hollis-right.com 
and click on the Contact Us button. We know your time is valuable, so thank you for spending it with us and watching The Attorney. Attorneys, proudly sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright, are here to serve you. When we started the show eight years ago, my hope was we would be able to do what we do best, which is to help people answer real-world legal-related issues they have in their life. People oftentimes are confronting various legal issues and problems in their lives that range across the gamut of legal practice areas, bankruptcy, criminal law, family law, just to name a few. And to be able to have a 30-minute platform or format to where we can just cover various legal topics once a week uh, that's obviously the primary focus of the show. That we would be able to use the resources of the many lawyers we have at this law firm to create a plan that had a lasting impact that also gave back to the community at the same time. And I think we've done just that with the attorneys. Welcome back in to the attorneys. Thanks for joining us this evening and interesting conversation we're having. We'd love to have you be a part of that. That information you'll see at the bottom of your screen all throughout the show tonight. Uh, questions. We've got quite a few questions. Let me get this one um, into you guys here. I hurt my leg while doing my job. I gave the doctor's bill to my boss who told me that I have to pay it because he doesn't carry workers comp insurance. I thought all employers had to have workers comp. Is, is that not correct? Well, here's here are the general guidelines. Uh, the law requires if, if an employer has more than five employees, then they are required to have workers' compensation insurance coverage. Okay. Now, there's some exceptions like agricultural workers, farmers, don't, aren't, aren't, that rule doesn't apply to them. That's statutory. Um, but that is the general rule. And also, you know, a lot of these employers might not have individual coverage. They may opt out um, of having individual coverage, but typically they are members of funds, um, you know, construction funds. Um, that would provide coverage for them. But the general rule is five or more employees. Can they have a self-insured policy? They can, and, and I guess that's what I was trying to say. They can be self-insured to the extent. A lot of times when they are self-insured, meaning you know, the employer may be, may be responsible for a large portion of the proceeds or at least a percentage of it, but typically when they are, they are part of a fund where they're yeah. similarly situated employers and they share in the risk. Alwyn can tell you too, because we, we run across this at the firm quite a bit, there are circumstances where people do not have workers' comp insurance and they can be on the hook in addition to what the regular benefits would have been in a work-related claim notwithstanding that you can bring suit against that company for not having workers' compensation insurance. So there are some options even if they don't have workers' yeah, comp insurance. Yeah, and just to, to further uh, show, illustrate Joe Josh's point is that would be referred to as an Employer's Liability Act claim. If you yeah. don't have um, insurance, workers' comp insurance, you have more than five employees, you can really sue under negligence. You know, yeah. that, that's a good avenue. Tell, tell us in just general terms the elements someone can collect if they have a workers' compensation claim. Typically you have you have what's referred to as compensation benefits. If someone is injured and they have to come out of work, then you know while they're recovering, they're entitled to temporary total disability benefits, which means it's temporary because you only pay these benefits while the healing process where you're temporarily injured. And that's two thirds of your average weekly wage. Then if you have a permanent injury, um, or, or some type of impairment to a body as a whole or the body part, you're entitled to permanent partial disability, which would be a percentage of that compensation rate, that TTD benefit that you are being paid. And that's paid for up to 300 weeks. And there are certain caps that apply. You also are entitled to vocational benefits, which would be um, if someone's unable to return to their pre-injury job status due to the restrictions they have, or the physical limitations, then they've sustained a vocational loss or loss yeah. of access to the job market. Um, the compensation is, is, is typically higher for those types of benefits than just an impairment rating. People can also be deemed to be permanently totally disabled. The injury, unfortunately, can be catastrophic and career ending. And those benefits are paid for the rest of your life, yeah. um, you know, with, with some caps and restrictions. You're also entitled to medical benefits for life. Um, there are some caveats to that, that typically the employer is, or the insurance carrier has the option to, to select the treating physicians 
for the injured employee with some exceptions and as long as the the symptoms or condition last the employer or insurance carrier is responsible for paying for treatment for that condition. One of the things that I would raise after that is <clears throat> people don't need to try and do this on their own. Like Going to a workers' compensation lawyer like Alwyn, who's one of the state's best in this area, super important. And the fees are fairly low for workers' comp, and they're statutorily defined. That's right. It, it, they're 15% by law. Um, that's the most the workers' compensation insurance attorney can take. And, you know, to point out what Josh was, was, was saying is... Um, in order to get a lawyer, just people should realize that, that, you know, we deal with insurance companies, insurance adjusters all the time. The insurance adjusters have been versed and trained in what the laws are in the state of Alabama. Um, they also have attorneys that work for these companies, the employer, that, that educate them and explain the laws to them. But here's the thing. While most people are honest and, and try to do the right thing, the insurance company or their adjusters are under no obligation to advise you what your rights are yeah. under the law. Right. And just remember, I mean, insurance companies, like, like most of us at work, we're in it to make money and to make a profit. And, I mean, the less that you know about the act, the, the more money you may be giving up. Yeah, so, I, you know, one of the keys is go to, David, <coughs> go to a lawyer early. They will evaluate your case at no cost to you. And then if there is a workers' compensation case, they're going to work with the insurance company, its lawyers, etc., to make sure that you maximize the all the potential coverages that you've got. Another question we've got here. My job requires a lot of heavy lifting. After I finished one of my shifts last week, my back and legs started hurting the next morning to the point I couldn't stand. I still have a hard time moving. My job's insurance company told me they wouldn't send me to a doctor because my injury was not payable under workers' compensation. What do I do now? Well, that was probably, you know, that, that's an example of report the incident or, or the accident or injury as soon as possible. And that happens a lot. I have a lot of people that say I hurt my, myself, my back, particularly at the end of a shift and it, I couldn't stand up the next day or I had problems. Right. Immediately report it to your employer. Um, if they refuse to turn it over to, to the insurance company to make a claim, because they'll have to call their company and their company will have to call you and you'll have to give a statement, then you need to go to a lawyer. Don't let it sit and don't let time pass because it will just muddy the water. The more time that passes, the worse things that can happen and, and the harder it is for an injured employee to prove they had a claim or an injury that resulted from work. Well, one of the issues that I, I know comes up a lot in your practice, Alwyn, is someone calls you and says, look, this doctor is uh, provided through the workers' compensation uh, carrier. Uh, I don't like them. They have a bad bedside manner, mm -hmm. whatever. And, and, and sometimes that may be improper, and sometimes maybe they're accurate, all right? Mm -hmm. What do you advise that client, uh, what their options are to be able to be evaluated by other doctors? The Workers' Compensation Act does allow for a one-time selection of a, a panel of four physicians. Now, the insurance company gets to choose four new physicians um, for you to select one of the four to treat you for your condition. And um, that's when you become dissatisfied with the original authorized treating physician. Then once you choose a new physician, it becomes, quote, the authorized treating physician um, to treat your condition. Now, and understand, you know, you may have a broken ankle and a head injury. And, you know, that doesn't mean you only get one doctor for your ankle and your, your brain because right. you have brain doctors and you have foot doctors. So yeah. you can get panels for different for different conditions or injuries within a claim. All right, when we come back, because I know we're about to get a break, I want to talk about some actual practical <clears throat> examples of how the schedule works for certain injuries, body parts, et cetera, because I think that will be eye-opening for people that are watching. All right, we're stepping aside our final break of the evening. As we do so, a reminder, you really want to follow Hollis right on social media, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, wherever you are, they are. Uh, just search the term Hollis right and you'll find them. They're really uh, educational, informational follow on social media. Stay tuned. More of the attorneys coming right up. I'm Josh Wright with the law firm Apollos Wright. As with any industry, it's important in the legal world to hire an attorney that is knowledgeable and has a track record of success. But with so many attorneys out there and so many different types of cases, how does someone decide the right lawyer to hire? In this week's Legal 4 and 1, we're answering the question, what should I consider in hiring an attorney? In-state versus out-of-state, big firm or little firm? 
recommendations from friends or family, the internet, the phone book or TV with so many choices and so much information, it can be an overwhelming task trying to make the right decision. To complicate things, choosing a lawyer is an important and sometimes life-affecting decision and should not be taken lightly. So how do you select an attorney? First, do your research. Look the firm up on the internet. Learn about the cases they handle and the results they get. Second, find out what clients are saying about the firm. Many websites provide client testimonials or have a star ranking system. Use those to your advantage. And finally, talk with a lawyer from their office and ask them questions. Questions about the volume of cases they handle, do they return phone calls? Are you just a number or a client that gets the attention you deserve? Please remember, your call, email, or text to the attorneys is free. All of us at Hollis Wright want to help answer your questions on real issues you face. Remember, a confident lawyer will respond to every question you send in. That's our pledge and promise to you. Thanks for watching The Attorneys right here on WBTM 30. Welcome back into the attorneys. About six minutes remaining in the show. So if you want to take advantage of that opportunity to speak with attorneys from Hollis Wright, about six minutes to do so. So I'll pick up the phone and give them a call. Josh. Um, all right. So Alwyn, let's, let's talk just for a minute. Explain in general terms, using maybe some examples of how the schedule works to define someone's recovery and workers' comp if sure. they've got an injured body part or an area of their body is injured. How, how does that work in general terms? Josh, you know, in the Workers' Compensation Act, you have scheduled member injuries and then injuries that are referred to as whole, whole body or whole person injuries. And there's actually a list in these statute that provides for a list of scheduled injuries or scheduled body parts and it affects how much compensation you can get. For example, fingers are scheduled, arms are scheduled, hands are scheduled, feet, toes, eyes, ears, those are scheduled injuries and you're entitled to under, under the law, you, you can only get with, with, there are ways around it, but generally speaking, you can only get an impairment rating for the loss of a scheduled member, meaning the percentage or, or the value of your claim, since it's a percentage of a loss of a scheduled member, is going to be less than, than if you had a whole body injury with a potential vocational loss. Um, the whole body injuries are typically injuries that where you have a spine injury, a head injury, shoulder injuries, hips. Um, and and with, a, with a whole body injury, you're entitled to to claim that vocational loss or loss of access to the, to the job market if you can't return to your pre-injury job. With scheduled injuries, and there are ways around this, but a lot of times an insurance company is gonna, you know, say, say you get your arm cut off. I mean, you know, if you went strictly by the scheduled member, um, you know, s statements in the statute, that would be worth um, $44,000 under Alabama law. But there are ways a good attorney can get around that and claim this really affects the body as a whole, this is a permanent total injury claim um, or a vocational loss claim and the compensation can be much higher. Did, did you hear how he used good attorney? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what we're talking about. So yeah. a lot of this, as, as, I mean, as, as Alwyn clearly points out, a lot of this is uh, some level of negotiation back and forth between the insurance company and the lawyer. It's another reason why you want to go to a lawyer early to be able to evaluate whether or not you have a whole body injury, a partial body injury versus a scheduled injury mm -hmm. because it can impact significantly what you recover. You and Owen have known each other a long time, have worked together a long time, and have just had incredible success working together. Why do you think what he brings to the table, what you all bring to the table, works so well and is so effective? Yeah, so when, when Alwyn joined our law firm, I was so happy for that to happen, not just because we were buddies for years, but I was really happy that that happened because the work that he does a lot of times in um, the workers' comp setting spills over into a lot of the work that I do, which is more industrial accent-based uh, litigation, um, claims against third parties. Take an example of uh, a forklift driver, uh, may not be an employee, 
persons injured on the job by that forklift that was used on the job, that person has a workers' compensation case, but the forklift driver, as an example, who maybe was negligent, wasn't paying attention, was you know on drugs, whatever, um, that forklift driver could have independent liability outside workers' comp where we could recover. So Alwyn and I work together to make sure that the person's case is evaluated completely and comprehensively um, to make sure that we value their cases completely. Alwyn also talked just a minute about how although employers can't be brought into a suit other than through workers' comp, there are circumstances where co-employees that do certain acts and engage in certain conduct could be. That's right, Josh, and they're referred to, as you said, co-employee claims, and there's a section 25511 in the Alabama Workers' Compensation Act that allows for four for general situations where you can sue a co-employee for intentional misconduct. You know, um, a lot of, not a lot of times, but an example of that would be is if one employee, say a supervisor, got drunk or got another employee drunk that caused the injuries of somebody on the job. The typical or the most the, 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 I guess the claim we see the most, the situation we see the most, is when there's a removal of a safety guard. You have yeah. a lot of employers where you have assembly lines or it's mass production, and the more they produce, the more money they make. Yeah. So they remove safety guards and safety devices that can a lot of times, such as light shields or, or presses or lock in, lock out, tag out procedures that can result in injuries to, to an employee. And the injured employee can file a claim against the co-employee, but not the employer. That yeah. is an exception. We're just about out of time, but I want to give both of you the opportunity for a final thought. And Alwyn, if you would, you go first, please. Well, my thought is this, is just remember that as, as good an employee, a nice person as you want to be, that you need to protect yourself and your family, go to a lawyer, have your claim filed because if, if things get worse later and you hadn't done that, you're, you're causing trouble for yourself. Josh. Yeah, you know, what I would say, David, um, is, you know, the union of Alwyn's firm that he had and our firm joining forces um, uh, allows an individual who may have been injured on the job to have a complete comprehensive evaluation of your claim. We just raised in this last segment this concept of co-employee litigation, industrial accident, third-party litigation, uh, basic negligence that could be applicable in circumstances where you're injured on the job, where normally workers' comp doesn't allow for that. If you want a complete and a comprehensive evaluation of your case, Alwyn at our law firm is a great union mm -hmm. and uh, it's great for the client. So if there's someone out there, don't be afraid to come to us to have their case evaluated, both by Alwyn and our, our group uh, to comprehensively evaluate the case. Great, great job. job. Thanks thank for being Thank you. On the appreciate show. y'all having me. Thank you both for being with us and thank you for being with us as well. We always appreciate uh, the time that we spend together. We uh, look forward to seeing you next week right here on The Attorneys. Have a great week, everybody. Thanks for watching The Attorneys, sponsored by Hollis Wright.